Hello, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, we are a nonprofit working for fast, frequent, and reliable trains across the country. Um, we've got people still signing in. We're at about 50 right now. So um, in the meantime, while we get started, I'll give a little update on what's happening in DC. Uh, right now, the, there are two things happening simultaneously. One is uh, the annual appropriation, which happens every year and which is where the real money gets spent. Um, and the other is the multi-year authorization, which defines what the programs are. Um, and so those are happening both simultaneously. They both have deadlines of September 30th of this year, but nobody expects either program to, or either of those to happen on time. Um, so the first issue that will come up is the appropriation. And we're most concerned about the um, Amtrak piece of that. Uh, with COVID and the ridership dropping and the revenue dropping so much, especially on the Northeast Corridor, um, where ridership is, is about 10% this year of where it was last year, um, there's a dramatic drop in revenue. Um, fortunately, on the long distance trains, the drop has not been about as much. It's been about 35%. Uh, demonstrating how strong a, a service those are. Uh, but Amtrak is looking for additional money over its typical annual appropriation in order to keep the system running as it is right now. They're asking for basically $5 billion. Um, and hopefully we can get something close to that in a continuing resolution or uh, soon when there is an appropriation. Um, if you go to our website, there's a place where you can send a message to Congress about that. The other concurrent thing that's happening right now is the reauthorization of the overall program. And that um, hopefully we can get not only the program that we have now, but something much improved. And we're really excited that Congressman Moulton has put together a really exciting program for how to move that forward. Um, and again, if you go to our blog section on our website, um, you can see an overview of that. Um, any, if you have any questions at any point, please type them out um, in the question and answer section. Um, and as appropriate, I um, will ask those questions as we go along. Um, so I'm really excited. Oh, one last thing. Our philosophy is you can't look at city pairs, right? High-speed rail advocates, including myself for a long time, talked a lot about city pairs, 100 to 300 miles apart. Uh, that's not how we did the highway system. It's not how we did the aviation system. It's not how we're going to do the rail system. We need to think about in networks. Lots of interconnectivity. And that way each segment has a lot more riders because people are connecting between each segment. Uh, so you can't just look at city pairs, you gotta look at a bigger system. And we're really excited that California is the first to do this with its rail network and has actually created an operating plan uh, for 20 years out of how the trains will operate it in a statewide interconnected network with high-speed rail as the trunk that brings a lot of volume to the other things. And in the first phase, um, they are proposing to build a high-speed line and it's under construction between Merced and Bakersfield. Um, and then concurrently, a lot of other things will improve while that happens. And with us today, we have Dan Levitt, who is the manager of regional uh, rail initiatives, regional initiatives, at the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission. Um, and that commission is responsible for the ACE commuter rail and Amtrak San Joaquin services. And he's going to talk about what that first phase looks like for those two services. So uh, Dan, um, if you're ready to go, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Great, thanks Rick. And so I'm gonna get my PowerPoint up. So go to the screen share. 
Dude, I have. So Sorry you, about that. Okay, let me try again. Uh, you should be able to do that now. Okay. There we go. Great. So you can see my PowerPoint. Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. And I just want to just say first of all, we we are we <laughs> we've been hit hard by this uh, pandemic, like everyone else. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that we are struggling through. Um, both of our services, the ridership is, is way down from it was last year. Uh, the ACE commuter service down 90%. So we only have 10% of our riders from last year. Uh, Samuel Keynes are, are, are down about 80%. So about 20, we only have about 20% of our, our riders. Um, however, uh, the, my presentation today is not one of, of, of being down about this. It's more uh, optimistic, optimistic about uh, a bright future for rail transportation in uh, the Central Valley of California and California as a whole. And uh, that we have some really great work that's, that's currently underway that I wanted to make sure that this group was, was aware of. But we, we do feel there's a very bright, that rail transportation has a very important role in California's future and that this current crisis will, will not um, impede that. Just a little bit, and for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with our two, two services, as mentioned, uh, the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority, which I represent, uh, we are the managing agency uh, for the, the San Joaquins. They are operated by Amtrak. They're funded by the state of California. The San Joaquins have been around for decades. Uh, prior to, to, to COVID, we were running uh, seven daily round trips. So I'm gonna turn off the computer noise. Seven daily round trips, five between uh, the Bay Area and, and Bakersfield and two between Sacramento and Bakersfield. Right now during COVID, we're down to four daily round trips just between the Bay Area and, and, and Bakersfield. With the ACE Rail service, this is a commuter service that we are the owner operator for that has been operating for over 20 years. Uh, before COVID, we were running four daily round trips focused on the weekday service during commute periods, uh, carrying 1.5 million passengers a year, focusing on the, the markets between the Northern Valley and the Silicon Valley and the Tri-Valley area in the Bay Area to the Silicon Valley. The, the key program I'm talking about today is really our, our expansion program for both ACE and San Joaquin's, which we call Valley Rail. Uh, we've already secured more than a billion dollars of state funds to expand our ACE service down to Stanislaus and Merced counties, and also to extend ACE up to Sacramento and do that in partnership with the San Joaquin's, where we'll be sharing uh, a track with both ACE and San Joaquin's to get more service to Sacramento. All the, the yellow dots you see on here um, are, are new stations that we will be building as part of this program. This slide shows you more detail about the alignment from Stockton to Sacramento. And a key here is that we, we are having to, I mean, the, right now, the only two trains we have going to Sacramento are San Joaquin's trains, and they're on the blue line that you see. That's the UP's main line, the Fresno subdivision. We, we, UP has, had no interest in additional pasture service on their main line in this area. And, and so instead we worked out a partnership with, with UP to work on a different line a, a sub, a, called the Sacramento subdivision, which is lightly used uh, to have more passenger service, both for ACE and San Joaquin trains. Uh, as a part of this, we are, we're going to have to build new stations or aren't stations along this line. Uh, it does have some trade-offs in serving Sacramento. One of the positive things is we can serve more stations in the Sacramento area and that this line can extend beyond Sacramento in the future. Uh, we are looking to have in the north a, a station uh, that will serve the Natomas area that will have a nice convenient connection to Sacramento International Airport. This slide shows where we're expanding the A service down to Modesto and ultimately down to Merced. And what's shown kind of faintly on this line, um, ACE will run on a different line than the San Joaquin's run on. The San Joaquin's run on the BNSF line, which is to the east, which you can kind of see very faintly on this map. But the key here for ACE is it runs through the hearts of the metropolitan areas. And so we'll serve downtown Modesto, downtown Ceres, downtown Turlock, and, and, uh, and either Livingston or Atwater. Uh, we've already completed the environmental work uh, to Ceres and Modesto, and we expect to have the first train running, uh, ACE train running down to Modesto, by 2022, 
Uh, we've got the environmental document out for the Sacramento piece and expect to have the final document out on um, the next month or so and construction to start for, for both of these sections uh, by next year. Uh, the environmental work has just begun from Ceres to Merced and that one's one a little bit behind, but we do expect the first train to run to Merced by 2025. This is kind of a key slide to share with you today and that's how this improvement Valley Rail program and ACE and Simo Keynes expansion really fits in with a proposed high-speed rail network. And I think probably many of you are aware that high-speed rail is looking to, to start their operations with a first segment between Merced and Bakersfield. And I, I, well, I can't speak for high-speed rail. I think it's very clear that their intention is not to stop there. They, they expect to use that as a first phase towards implementing their full statewide network, which will ultimately connect the Bay Area, Sacramento, Southern California, including San Diego, in a statewide high serial network. But this is the first phase, the first piece between Merced and Bakersfield. And you can see how our two services will connect with that at Merced, um, where ACE is extending to Merced, but we are also going to be truncating the San Joaquin's so that the San Joaquin's will no longer run to Bakersfield. Instead, they will connect at a multimodal, multimodal hub station in Merced with the San Joaquin's ACE and high-speed rail. And where today we only have two San Joaquin's trains going up to Sacramento, um, we are looking the next five years to have uh, seven trains that will go from Merced to Sacramento, three of those being ACE and four San Joaquin's. And then we'll still have the five San Joaquin's trains uh, going from Merced to, to Oakland, and we'll have at least one ACE train from Merced to, to San Jose. Uh, by 2030, high Street Rail is planning to, to, to operate 18 round trips a day between Merced and Bakersfield. And our goal is to be able to link every single one of those with either an ACE train or a San Joaquin's train at Merced. And this just kind of shows you a little closer up uh, sort of our, our network in Northern California between our two services. And I did want to highlight, we are working with Bay Area partners on another service that would be fully integrated with ACE in the Altamont corridor called Valley Link which would enable a, sep a separated infrastructure off of the UP line. We do run our ACE and San Joaquin trains on um, freight rail tracks, but if we're successful with this other program, we'd be able to get ACE off of uh, UP uh, line for a significant portion of the connection between Stockton and the Bay Area, which would enable us to run faster trains and uh, more frequent trains to the Bay Area. This is probably the key slide I want to show you today because a lot has been talked about how this first segment of high-speed rail is kind of isolated and we believe that uh, that couldn't be further from the truth where I've already shown you how we're connecting our rail service both the San Joaquin's and ACE uh, to the north but but also we have a, an extensive through a bus network for the San Joaquin's which will be fully integrated into connecting to this initial high-speed rail segment between Bakersfield and Merced and uh, while today, again, we were only offering several, several, seven round trips a day on the San Joaquin's, here you'd have 18 round trips a day connected with three-way buses throughout California. And so uh, this would be a, a much greater integration and a, and a better performing service than we have today. Uh, this high-speed segment cuts an hour and a half off the trip time uh, if you're traveling from Southern California to Northern California on, on a rail service, even including the, the transfer time that's, that's needed. And I should note on this too is that um, we are working with High Speed Rail that initially for this uh, early operations that uh, my agency, the San Joaquin JPA, would be initial operator <clears throat> on the High Speed Rail line and that we would look to have a single operator for the High Speed segment, ACE and San Joaquin. That would be our goal. And I just want to highlight the two. Once the high speed rail extends to, to the Bay Area, finishing the Valley to Valley segment, but still, as you can see here, the rest of the network that we're working on is still very valid and, and vital for high speed rail connectivity. Uh, and then high speed rail continue uh, to, to expand to Southern California. And our goal is, is as soon as we can to get a one seat ride to Sacramento as well. But we believe that will large, uh, likely come through further incremental improvement of the existing line so they can get electrified service. ICU Rail has, has looked at our current numbers and done forecasts on this network. We've been working very closely with them. 
Uh, they're forecasting that while we're today we're at you know, pre-COVID 2.6 million pastors between Ace and San Joaquin's, uh, once High Street Rail is operating, we'd be more like 8.8 .8 million pastors a year, which is a considerable increase from what we are today. Uh, there's a number of benefits that, that come to the state from this, um, but I think most importantly is this demonstrates true high-speed rail in this part of the world for the first time, 200 mile an hour operations that then can be further expanded in California and hopefully done in other parts of the country. And you may uh, have heard, there's been a lot of press, that there is a, a, an effort um, in Southern California to take some of the funding that the uh, High Street Authority and the administration are planning in the Valley to move that to Southern California to do com commuter rail improvements. Uh, we are working with others to, to try to oppose that and to really show our support for, for making this investment in the Valley that we think is so critical for high-speed rail and for the future of high-speed rail, but also for uh, the Central Valley, that this investment is, is critical for the future of the Valley that, that really needs economic improvement. And then I just have a couple other things, then you know, be willing to open up to whatever questions you have, but a couple other things that just I think are key to what we're working on today that will continue to improve our service. Uh, one is, is a project called the Stockton Diamond Grade Separation. Uh, the Stockton Diamond is where the UP and BNSF main lines cross, just south of downtown Stockton. This is the, the, the most congested, worst freight rail bottleneck in all of California. And we are working to grade separate this. Uh, we, are, we do have a couple of applications out to finish the funding, uh, both the state application through trade quarters for $100 million, and we have a build application out for $25 million. Uh, but this crossing, um, we are looking to, and on this slide here, sorry about how it's oriented, but north is actually to your left. That's not west, that's north. And we're looking to move the UP alignment, shift it to the east, and then elevate it. And uh, this will free up, really completely unclog the bottleneck. And uh, it has great benefits for, the, for freight for both UP and BNSF for, for their nationwide networks. But on the passenger side, it really enables us to, to, to continue to add trains beyond what we already have funded. And uh, so being able to run more ACE trains to the Bay Area, more San Joaquin's to the Bay Area, as well as more ACE and San Joaquin's to, to Sacramento and getting the ACE connection to Merced. And so uh, just this is kind of a little schematic showing you how what we'll be doing is, is basically bringing the UP over the BNSF. And then the other project that, that really is key that we're working on, we don't, this is where we don't have fully funded yet, but we need to get funded in the next several years, is the connection uh, for the San Joaquin's to that multimodal hub in Merced. The San Joaquin's, as I mentioned earlier, you know, run on the BNSF line. So we do need to bring them over in Merced to connect at the UP, uh, along the UP corridor, where they'll all high-speed rail ACE and the San Joaquin's all come together. Uh, we asked, we, this will be an elevated structure that, that we need to bring in, and it's estimated about $155 million. And so we are working on getting the funding and, and doing the environmental clearance uh, for this effort. And then I would just, uh, at this point, here's, here's our, we have a lot of information on our websites. I should have mentioned before, we do have a website for our stock and and grade separation as well. And here's my phone number, uh, open to any of your comments. Excellent. Are there any questions? Um, so Bill Porter is asking, um, it, what's the time frame for the connect for getting high speed rail from San Francisco to Bakersfield? And then in a similar vein, what's that first step time frame? Well, again, I just I want to be careful here. I, I represent the ACE rail service, the San Joaquin's, I'm not a representative of high speed rail. And, and so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going off of what their own information has. They do have a draft business plan that's out. I encourage you to take a look at that for 2020. Uh, they're looking to final that, finalize that by the end of the year. Um, they're showing a time frame that, they, that could have it implemented as early as, as you know, 2030, 2031. But the reality is they don't have the funding for it yet. Uh, the, the, so that's why they're focused on building an initial you know, starting operations, their interim operating segment between Merced and Bakersfield. So I think that even though they show a time frame that could happen, at this point they don't have the funding in order to be able to complete the segment uh, through the mountain pass to the Bay Area. 
So I don't know that they, they don't have a set schedule yet. Uh, they wanna do that as quickly as possible. They're working to get the environmental clearance, but they can't give a, a, a definitive schedule until they actually have the funds to complete it. Excellent. Um, Clyde, if you could type your question in the question and answers, um, I'll be able to see it there. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't yet know how to deal with raised hands. Um, so uh, Troy Hightower is asking, how will the three-way bus connections work in Bakersfield um, since the high-speed rail station is proposed to be at F Street instead of where the existing Amtrak station is? Well, first of all, hello, Troy. Um, and uh, this, as you, if you heard the presentation, that I mean, our plans for San Joaquin's, and this is working with the state, is that the San Joaquin is going to truncate at Merced once high-speed rail is operating. Uh, it, it just, uh, there's a number of reasons for that, but in particular, once high-speed rail is operating, our San Joaquin service between Merced and Bakersfield will not be able to compete with high-speed rail. I mean, high-speed rail is going to be so much better <laughs> that, that you really can't run an, you know, a, ser a service uh, that, 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 that's just so much inferior where we, we'd only be running you know, seven round trips a day. We can't offer the type of on-time performance, but, but high speed rail is gonna be more than an hour and a half faster. So it's gonna be faster, safer, more reliable, and we're, we're, we're proposing that the tickets would be relatively similar. So you, you really, there's, there's no, um, we have found no, no way that we could continue to operate the San Joaquin's between those markets. So really to answer your question, the San Joaquin's are gonna stop operating at Merced. Uh, the connection will be to high speed rail, to the terminus of high speed rail at Bakersfield. And that's and we will connect with High Speed Rail. Um, that that Southern California connection will be to the High Speed Rail station. And so today, or let's say pre-COVID, or today, whichever is or however you talk about this now, <laughs> what, what percentage of people arriving by train at Bakersfields do connect to a bus? About seventy-five percent. Okay. Oh, uh, they, I mean, uh, that's one thing that. You know, uh, the numbers of Bakersfield, I mean, we still have a very strong ridership from Bakersfield, but our much bigger ridership uh, is to Southern California. And, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize how important the three-way bus services are. Um, every, for our passengers, the San Joaquin's, uh, about 60% of our passengers are, are, are taking a three-way bus on at least one part of their journey. And some of them are taking three-way buses to, to two, on, on two legs of their journey. Uh, but it's a, it's a very critical part of, of the statewide network. And certainly the Southern California uh, links are our most used links. And so it's not just connecting people from Southern California to the Bay Area and to Sacramento. A lot of their passengers are coming from the San Joaquin Valley to, to the south as well. Um, and then Ross Capon is asking, about uh, what the plans are to restore the reductions and uh, well I, I would add to this he's asking the connecting buses yeah. but I would add to that the frequencies that that were cut uh, what's the yeah. about when those come back we, we want to bring them back as soon as we can but we, we I mean the key first is to get I mean we're, we got to get a point in this crisis we got to get through the crisis frankly and for us there'll be there'll be two steps to this. Um, one, first, we've got to get to a place where people feel comfortable uh, riding public transportation again, and, and that the ridership numbers start to really increase. Uh, once, and right now, um, even if the ridership was there, we'd have difficulties because we're, we're, we're having to you know, purposely decrease capacity, keeping the trains 50% you know, full at the max. So until we get to a point where we can start packing people more into trains again, it's gonna create problems in terms of being able to run more, more service. So that's, that's kind of a first thing. But um, the other part is too, is that we are fully replying. I mean, a lot of people don't realize this, but, but with the San Joaquin's, with the Capital Corridor, and with Pacific Surf Liner, these are fully funded by the state of California, even though they're operated by Amtrak, they are state funded. And we are gonna, we rely upon state funds and so, um, we're going to have to be seeing how the re, you know, recession that we're currently in as a result of this crisis impacts our ability to, to be able to get back to the level of service. And so there's two things. We've got to come out of the crisis 
but then we also need to have the funds available for us to be able to bring us help ourselves back. Um, we, we hope that this happens in the next couple of, you know, within the next couple of years, but we don't really have a, a, a time period yet because it's, 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 it's anyone's guess. Um, we are moving forward with our expansion program with the uh, understanding that we ex expect us to be out of this relatively soon. Um, I guess on the thoroughly bus side, it's the same issue. I mean, uh, we, we can't bring the thoroughly buses. We, we, we have reduced down our, our thoroughly bus services uh, and, and not only reduced them in terms of the frequency, but we've also reduced, uh, you know, cut some of them down. We've been working with, with Amtrak to, to be able to try to reduce how we do that, where we have some agreements that we've done now that I think have been quite creative. I, I appreciate Amtrak doing that on a couple of markets we thought we we're going to have to eliminate that we were able to work with Amtrak to keep service there. But it will really depend upon when we have funding and demand. Um, and did the law get changed that say you can't sell a local ticket on a bus? And if you could sell local tickets, would that help bring them back sooner? Uh, well, <laughs> well, we were, yes, it, the law did get passed. Uh, there are some, we, we did have to, uh, took a lot of effort. Um, we did have to make some concessions uh, in order to, to get that passed and get it signed. Um, we were just starting before COVID struck, we had been, we were ready to open up about 160 new station pairs. Oh, sorry, should say new uh, stop, new stops between bus stops that, that pre previously could not have been, uh, get, we could not have uh, sold tickets for. Um, we, we have to do this incrementally. We, we, in order, part of the thing that we agreed to in order to get the legislation passed was we do a lot of coordination with uh, inner city operators such as Greyhound and Flix, but also with local uh, operators and regional operators to make sure that we're not you know, providing some sort of uh, unfair competing service. Um, we'd already, we, we've been working on that. We, got, we had that going, we were just starting to open it and we had to basically shut it down because of COVID. And the reason here is that again, we have to, right now we've, our, our, our buses, were, our, our, our capacity is less, you know, it's basically half of what we were currently doing. And now we're, we're at, it's, you know, buses as well. So we, we don't really have the capacity today to try to, 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 to utilize that, um, that opportunity. Um, as soon as we get through this crisis, as soon as we uh, start giving more revenue, absolutely. We, we, we expect that to be a very, very important part of, of the future of our service is being able to sell bus only tickets. So we're very happy to get that legislation passed and signed and appreciate uh, the support we got from throughout California, particularly from RailPack. Um, and so what's the plan to integrate or is there a plan to integrate payment across High Speed Rail, ACE and the San Joaquin's? Well, that's what we're working on. Um, okay. We have some time, but we, we, uh, we're, we're starting that. And that's one, one thing that, um, you know, in their, in their business plan, their draft, part of the reason I think they're even waiting is uh, they'd, they'd come across uh, some questions about how we're going to work together and, and, and making sure that we had a, 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 an agreement in place. And so we are working through uh, an initial MOU. It will take, this will not solve, you know, answer all those questions, but it will start it and, and it will, uh, really identify the roles and responsibilities of the various partners and, and not just my agency but also high street rail and of calsta who, who who funds us for the samuel keens so uh that that mou um uh should be approved by all we're looking for our board to approve it in november it, it should be all approved by all parties before uh, high street rail takes action on their business plan or they might do it as part of their action with the business plan but we will be working with them over the next several years um, in, in terms of getting into all the details. Uh, but, but, but a key here is that, you know, I think that people are aware that high-speed rail is, is not to operate at a, a, at a subsidy. That's part of the reason that we'll be taking on sort of the initial operations. But we are, the, the, all the studies that, that have been done by us, and high, and particularly by high-speed rail, uh, have shown that the state subsidy for, for implementing high street rail, that we, the state subsidizes the San Joaquin's uh, today, and, and that when we implement high street rail, that the overall subsidy we expect to actually decrease as a result of the increased ridership and revenue that we expect from all the additional um, riders that we get with high street rail operating. Um, 
Uh, Bob Johnston has a, a tough question, maybe. Uh, <laughs> how will you have one operator for High Speed Rail Ace in San Joaquin's? Can Amtrak be that operator? Bert? I, I, I think, I mean, I, our, I believe in this, but we don't have an RFP out yet, obviously, that's something that's coming. But um, this will be a competitive process, and I, I believe there would be no restriction from Amtrak or any other uh, uh, operator that might be uh, able to to meet the criteria to to to, to compete for this. Um, Amtrak competes for other. I mean, I think that they, they they compete for a variety of different contracts, and so I don't think that's unusual. Um, but I don't think there would be any restriction. But that. I, but I, again, our RFP is not out, um, but uh, my understanding is that we'd be looking to, to have a competitive process. And uh, that is something that, I mean, again, I, I'm not sure exactly the timing, but we have a, we have a little bit of time. It does, it's not needed now, but I do want to note that it's not like we have until 2029 because we would want this operator in place prior to testing, which will happen several years before. So we, this is something that will be coming in the coming years, not years and years away, uh, there will be something out this relatively soon. This is something that we'll be focusing on uh, over the next couple of years. Excellent. Um, and then I think there's two stations that will be, that will lose San Joaquin service, but not gain high speed service. Uh, will there be a bus that will connect somehow? Yeah, the two that you mentioned, uh, Corcoran and, and Wasco, I should also know, I, I think they're really, I would say three, um, because even though there's a King Solari station, uh, downtown Hanford will not be directly served, which, which you know, is, is a loss. I, I mean, so we, we recognize that as well. We are currently working, we've got some funds from High Speed Rail, and we are working on how best to connect uh, downtown Hanford Corcoran and Wasco into the system so that they are able to continue to have access. And we, we, we have those studies underway. Uh, we are working closely with the, uh, the local regional uh, entities. Um, we've been working with Kern Cog, with the city of Wasco, with uh, Kings County and Tulare, as well as the, uh, uh, the regional providers, uh, CART, which is, serves Kings County, and then Tulare, uh, Visalia Trans Transit uh, Agencies. Um, so we, we are working on that. It's, it, we, we are looking at opportunities that there's potential, you know, to, uh, you know, we do have slots that will be available on the, on the DNSF line. Uh, we are looking into that uh, as a possibility for uh, a sort of a regional commute type service, long distance commute, kind of the way ACE does. Um, but in, in sort of initial looks, there, there are some difficulties with that. Uh, there's some high costs associated with it. Uh, a, you know, bus connections, um, shuttle, short shuttle like we currently have, or working in partnerships with the local providers may, may provide a, a more viable solution for connecting those three stations. And so the Hanford is replaced by Kings to Larry. Correct. Okay. So, we, but we, so we will be looking at how to connect it. Um, and, and again, I think that one thing is, is it should be a problem, I mean, one of our biggest markets on the San Joaquin's, a lot of people don't love it, but if you look at our number one station pair over the years, it, it'd be pretty, pretty surprising to most people that it's, that it's Hanford to, to Fresno. And, and the reason is, is that San Joaquin's, by their nature, really can't carry a lot of commuters just because we're such a long distance service. We don't get to Sacramento till, till later morning. We don't get to the Bay Area till late morning. So you really, the only place, we only have a very few markets where you can carry commuters and Hanford to Fresno is one. But the reality is we don't really serve that market very well because uh, we only have like one train that really hits a commute period. And sometimes even as we move things, it can really benefit. And we've lost a lot of those commuters because um, it's just hard to, to be able to serve them with one, one train sort of each direction. High speed rail is going to offer, I mean, by 18 round trips a day, we're going to get a lot of markets in the valley that we currently can't serve. So in addition to the long distance trips, you, we will be serving passengers on some of these shorter distance trips. Uh, we, right now, we, there's no market between Madera and Fresno for commute. We'll be serving that market with high speed rail because we'll have the kind of frequency and it'll be very attractive. So uh, I, I think that, that, I mean, there's, there's going to be a lot of benefit that people aren't thinking about even within the Valley for this service once we get it operating. Um, 
And then uh, there's a couple of questions here that I think overlap. So Valley, tell me about Valley Link and eBART and how they relate to this. And I think that will take care of those questions. Yes, I, I touched upon that a little bit. And if, if you want, I can, uh, this probably might help. I, I, you know, I try to, I could not talk endlessly on this stuff, but um, Valley Link is what you see in the sort of the lighter blue here. And the initial section of Valley Link is supposed to go from Dublin Pleasant and Bart Station to Lake North Lathrop. And, uh, we are we have been working it's they have their own authority it's just trying to move the project forward called the tri valley sound key valley regional authority uh they do have powers in order to implement they, and they have now i mean they have access to some significant funding there's uh about 600 million dollars that that really they have that they don't have it in hand yet but they're very close to having that money it's it's really pretty much allocated to their project now they're going to need more like a couple billion to really get this project going. Uh, so they have a ways to go, but they, but they have money that they can leverage to get additional funds. And we are working, we, we, we are part of the, the, the authority. We have membership on it in terms of my agency. Uh, we are partners with them. We've been working together so that we have a, a, a integrated plan between ACE and Valley Link so that we really serve, serve different markets. And that also we will be, as I mentioned, sharing, our plan is to share track. So that you know, this will help ACE expand in the future, but, but also that like, we're gonna be looking to go to a, a, a joint measure in San Joaquin County. Again, once, the rec once our, we, we start to recover a bit, we were hoping to do it in 2022, but it might be 2024 instead. But we will be looking to have a shared infrastructure that we both have, so we are working together to, to get additional funding to move things forward. And uh, so Valley Link provides, you know, right now I mentioned that our ACE trains, we only have four daily round trips. That's because we're running on, on, on largely single track freight railroad. Valley Link would, would offer uh, separate tracks. And so you could have very frequent service between uh, San Joaquin County and BART, which from our perspective, it's very complimentary to ACE because if you look at our ACE service, our big markets to the Silicon Valley, we don't, we hardly, we have very few passengers that use ACE to go to Oakland or San Francisco because we just don't, we're not very competitive for those markets. Valley Link serves those other markets that we don't serve well. It also gives ACE a better connection to BART. And so some of our ACE passengers who are traveling longer distances like from Sacramento or to from Merced or other places once we extend might use a connection over to Valley Link to get to BART. But if you look on this map, you can really see that, you know, Valley Link is in the short, shorter distance trips, frequent all day, whereas ACE is, is more longer. I mean, we serve a bigger market, connecting to High Sea Rail, connecting to Sacramento, and bringing pastures to the South Bay. We, we view these as very complementary, and that the corridor demands this kind of infrastructure. Uh, today, if people aren't aware, I mean, like I said, we say today, pre-COVID, we were carrying just on, on mostly on automobile, over 92,000 uh, commuters a day going over the hill to the Bay Area from Northern San Joaquin Valley, over 92,000 a day. ACE, with our limited capacity, we were only carrying about 3,000 of those on ACE. We need more rail service to be able to get more of those people out of their cars. And so eBART is, there's like a small section of Valley Link, correct? So eBART, e e Valley Link can be considered Ebar, it's the same idea as eBART. eBART currently exists, and eBART you can ride it. It, it was the extension of BART from uh, West, you know, West Pittsburgh area to Antioch, and uh, it's running and it's doing very well. And it's a it's a it's a DMU type you know equipment that connects to BART, and you have to do a transfer. That's really the same idea for Valley Link. Uh, it's just that Valley Link would go further and take it over the hill and go into the to uh, San Joaquin Valley into, into San Joaquin County. Now, they're, they're looking at other things. I mean, they want to, you know, by the time it gets built, hopefully rather than diesel, they could be running on battery powered or, or they will be looking at electrification, but certainly their, their, their goal is, is to get to a zero emission vehicle as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, so is there, I was told there was, is a significant amount of traffic today, probably going by car, that goes from the Central Valley to Las Vegas. And so what, how does, 
high speed rail to Bakersfield, bus to Victorville, and then high speed train from Victorville to Las Vegas. Will that, does that help address that? Is there a market there and does that help address that? Well, I would, I mean, we say big, it's not, I don't, I don't know the size of it. I mean, it's, it's small comparison. When I talked about the commute market to the Bay Area, that's a, that's a huge market. Um, there, there absolutely is a market. I mean, Vegas is a, <laughs> it's an attraction for all of California. So absolutely there's a market and, and, and that it, we're in, Sometimes with markets, we get caught up and, and we got to be careful about the numbers because, you know, is it a market that, that we can serve well? And, and I think that the answer there is absolutely rail can capture, even if the market's not huge, rail could get a pretty large percentage of it because it's hard to get there from other modes, particularly from the valley. So the idea is it's, you know, it's hard to fly there and you don't really want to drive. And I mean, it's a very, very uncomfortable drive. So rail is a really valid option even if you have to do some some you know, initially some transfers to get there but I think ultimately the goal is to be able to do a one seat ride on high speed rail from the valley the bay area sacramento valley all the way to vegas through the connection that's being planned uh you know from victorville to and then that's where the connection would ultimately be initially we're gonna have to do it you know it won't be as ideal but we'll do it through different connections and, and that's what you see on this map we are showing that we would plan to, I mean, you know, we're showing that existing, that sort of the pink line from Victorville to Vegas. If that line isn't construction constructed, then we'll continue with our bus service all the way to Vegas. So it'll be a bus connection until that's ready. And then once that's running, we'll connect to, to the, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name that they're calling it now, but we'll, we'll connect to the new service that, that, that Virgin is looking to run uh, between, you know, to, to Vegas. Now Virgin is out. <laughs> Are they out? They're they out. Went, I've already missed that. They went out. <laughs> yeah, it's it's back to Brightline with no. Well, I, I thought, okay, so bright. So sorry, Brightline. But whatever. I'm forgetting what they're calling it now. But but um, certainly we will. We would be looking to have that connection once it's available. And and I think ultimately that wouldn't be by you know bus. Ultimately, it'd be by it'd be a complete one seat ride on high speed rail. And I think that starts to answer the question that someone else had about why not go down I-5. Um, I was told that I-5, you'd have to be, what is it, 300 meters under the San, uh, San Andreas Fault. Um, but also, if, if Brightline does do Victorville to Las Vegas, um, and you get the high-speed line running between Merced and Bakersfield, now it's a lot easier to make the case for crossing to hit to hit Hatchapies. And that gets you to the point where you can either then take Metrolink down the Antelope Valley or Brightline is even talking about going into the Eastern Bay. LA. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, and then when you say about I-5, you're talking about the, the cross, and the person I guess is talking about the Tehachapi crossing, but we all get that sometimes people ask me in the valley why why in the valley why are you going down to 99 rather than i-5 and I, I think that one thing i just like to say before you respond to either of those things um I me mean, this 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 your group that your your support group for high speed rail and i know that sometimes uh advocates can 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 uh get you know we we want to there's a lot of things that that you know maybe don't, don't fully make sense but the, i think the bigger picture to them but the bigger picture here is if we don't stick together, we're gonna have problems. I mean, high sea rail is threatened right now in California. The assembly, uh, you have a number of members who are looking to take money away. That, I mean, even though, look, Metrolink needs funding. There's no question that, that Metrolink should have get additional funds, but not with high speed rail money in our, in our opinion. That, that if, if this money is taken away from high speed rail, we believe that that will be the end of high speed rail connecting north or north and south in California, and that it will not come back. Uh, and, and even though, you know, if they if they take this away, if the money goes away, uh, we will be in a situation where we will we will run San Joaquin trains over it, but we will be stuck to about set our seven daily round trips. Um, you'll see some improvement. We'll be running be able to run you know over 100 miles per hour for for a portion of our route, but we believe that will be viewed as a colossal failure. For California that we spent all these billions of dollars and all we get is a moderately improved San Joaquin service. So um, we, we, there is a battle that's going on right now and, and certainly the proponents of high speed rail we'd hope that you know 
even though you might have differences of opinion on certain things, we hope that you could come together and like, like, like we have with High Speed Rail and, 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 and try to save this and, and keep this moving so that we can get true High Speed Rail service up and running. Some of these things that come up like I-5, I mean, look, th this has been looked at in California for decades. Uh, the, the decision to, to go in the Valley, I-5 versus 99, I mean, originally when High Speed Rail was thought of in, in, in the state of California, I-5 was looked at, but there was, the, the Valley was gonna absolutely fight High Speed Rail going down I-5 because the Valley views I-5 uh, highway as being something that bypasses the, the key communities in the Valley and that once again the valley would be hurt by free by by having uh investment that doesn't serve the valley so high speed rail really got started in fact and, and really is here we're, we're working on high speed rail today because of the valley uh let members of the legislature have pushed getting the service moved forward in part to help serve the central valley so uh, i mean that is part of the history there for the i-5 and the grapevine area whether you're why are, why are we going to palmdale in part because that's where Southern California really wanted the alignment to go. The other part deals with the issue of, of, of the faults and, and the difficulties getting through the grapevine, much much more difficult pass with, with, uh, with issues getting through there, much longer tunneling needed getting through the, the, the grapevine. But also that's, I mean, Southern California really wanted the alignment to go via the Antelope Valley for a variety of different reasons. But now as it's working out, it makes a lot of sense with the connections to, to Las Vegas as well. Yeah, and so I think those kinds of discussions are, are you looking at the big city pairs only or are you looking at a big network that serves a lot more people? Um, and certainly uh, the routing that has been chosen uh, does maximize the number of people that that are served in a really exciting way. Um, and I share your view that it's absolutely essential that, the Cali that California continue aggressively on getting electrified 200 mile an hour trains between Merced and Bakersfield as soon as possible. And that's the only way you get through the momentum that it's, you know, the, the challenges of being the first to run a high speed train in this country the new issues around electrification, on and on and on. You've got to actually, this will solve, figure out how to solve those problems elsewhere in the country. So we are very focused on, on making that happen. Um, we're getting very close to the time. Let me look through the questions real quick. Um, Karen Hedlund wants to remind us that there's a connection being planned for Victorville to Palmdale, where it will connect with the main Los, uh, where Brightline will connect with the main Los Angeles, San Francisco trunk. Um, okay. And Um, so, what are the opportunities to speed up the service on the San Joaquins between Merced and Oakland, and perhaps add frequencies on that segment? Excellent question. Uh, we think really good. Uh, uh, BN um, has interest in, in uh, having higher speeds. I, I probably should have. I mean, there's UP on their main line, seventy miles, seventy nine miles per hour is it. Uh, on the SAC sub, UP will, will allow us to go faster. We think that, I mean, ultimately we can get up to 110 even potentially on the Sacramento sub, but, but certainly 90 is, is in range for the Sacramento sub. BN is certainly uh, open um, to 90 mile an hour operations. And um, uh, we, we certainly are pursuing looking at that where it makes sense with them, but, but looking at a future where we are able to do faster speeds. Um, a key, I think, as you know, is, is, is between Martinez and Oakland, it's really, really slow. Um, and we're, we're extremely constrained in terms of capacity. So uh, we will be looking at the Franklin Canyon area, uh, which BN runs. It'll need a lot of improvement. Um, but that is something that we'll be looking at with, with BN to see if we could figure out a way for a future that um, would, would be able to enable us to get into the Bay Area quicker with the San Joaquins. 
with more service and, and faster travel times, absolutely, we are looking at that. Excellent. And that's, you know, coming from a part of the world where we're still running commuter cars that were built in 1956. Um, it is so exciting to talk to Californians because the, you're dealing with, okay, so we've got this big problem. Let's figure out how we can solve it. Maybe we don't know how we'll get the money to yet, but let's figure it out. And that it makes, I get so excited when talking to any of the different uh, players in the California Rail Network. Um, so unless there's, I think we covered basically everything um, is, um, uh, let's see here. There were two questions about passenger demand. Um, and I, Jim, I think what you mean is, is that public someplace? So I will ask that. Is the source, what, what are the ridership forecasts? Where could we find those or are they public? Well, the ones that I, I presented for here earlier, I mean, it's all on the High Sea Rails business plan 2020. It's on their website. Uh, they have uh, supporting documents. That, that are there um, that go through all the assumptions. And so that, that work deals with sort of the, the big picture that includes high-speed rail. And uh, I, I believe now they are working on some of it. You know, they, they've continued to do more forecasts, but um, it's all on their website. Excellent. So um, thank you very much, Dan, for joining us. This was a very helpful conversation. Um, and I, again, it's, it's very encouraging to talk with folks looking for solutions on how we improve the network and not just high speed rail or not just commuter rail, how we do the two together. I want to remind the audience that the current urgency is that the entire Amtrak network is in serious trouble, in, including the Northeast corridor. For some reason, Amtrak is focused on their desire to cut the core of the system, the, the 15 long distance trains that run overnight, their focus is on cutting those from seven trains a day down to three trains a day, which will be disastrous for the nation's, nation's passenger rail network. Um, if you go to our blog at hsrail.org, there is a link where you can send a message to Congress saying two things, please fund Amtrak at the requested uh, 5 billion and two, uh, include a line in there that says they have to run every route at least daily. Um, so thank you again, Dan. Thank and you. Uh, we will talk again very soon. Great. Really appreciate you having me on today and appreciate what your organization does.